Welcome back to our seminar series, Sri Prabhupada, our Father Acharya, celebrating Sri Prabhupada's preeminent position in this time, as well as every flower's foundational relationship with him. Okay, we're deep in the heart of Abhidhya. The first three lessons. For Sambanda, I presented in January where we discovered that Sri Prabhupada provides our core identity, our core relationship, and the sooner we understand that deeply, the more unity and cooperation we will have. And this is not in Sambanda. Okay, I have to keep this in mind. Give me a little key. Give me a little key. Let's put a little key. Can't you hear me like this? You want one, you want one. In India, they, they like your ear breaking decibels, right? Okay, we don't like that. <laughs> okay, so yesterday we tried to have the full lesson of the temple, but it didn't work. I gave you the bones of the lesson. And everybody liked the bones. And then we did the full flesh and bones and spirit upstairs in Shankar Hall, the next door. Padma Hall? Padma Hall. And day in the history of the world. She had gone by left Calcutta, and for 35 days he was on that ship, the water messenger, Jala Dutta. Finally, the ship came across, the Atlantic became like a lake, Captain Pandya said, Oh, Swamiji, you must come back with us. We've never seen the Atlantic like this. Luckily for us and the whole world, I thought you'd go back with Captain Pandya. So on September 17, 1965, at 5.30 a.m., the same time of day, that Sri Bhakti Siddhartha Saraswati Thakur left this world, that Jalanuta docked in Commonwealth Pier, Boston Harbor, and when that ship docked, Prabhupada wrote a poem by a teenage Dharma, teaching Krishna consciousness in the mirror. So, here's how we start. After a lifetime in preparation, our founder Acharya's mission appears on the world scene as ISKCON, the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. Before we examine how Srila Prabhupada manifested ISKCON in phases, let's look at and listen to his mood and his mission as he himself expressed it upon arriving in America. So before we do the, the power, before we do lesson five, proper the PowerPoints for lesson five, we do a transition event. It's an 11-minute video that was put together by a person who never met Prabhupada physically, UK Padma Singh, second generation uh, Padma Singh devotee at the Bhaktivedanta Manor. And he put this together as a multimedia gas puja offering for Sri Prabhupada at the manor in 2008, 2009, something like that. So what we're going to see now is his offering. And when you see this, it's, it's such powerful evidence that to be close to Prabhupada, you don't have to have seen it physically. It's all about being absorbed in the love and the light and following Prabhupada's everlasting, ever manifest, ever present mind. Okay, here we go. I'm just going to watch it with you. Do it. Let's hope it plays properly. Okay, first, we get out of here. Yeah. 
but space. There is no right or wrong answer. Sandy Pani Moon, what do you see in front of space? You see probably many things, but what's the dominant mood? So what, how do you sum that up? You, you, you said. Right. Compassion. Prabhupada cared. Sadhus traditionally do not cross the ocean, as you well know, to associate people with like me. Born and raised on sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and meat, and fish, and eggs, and gambling, and a whole mess. So, this, is, this video is very powerful evidence. And to be close to Prabhupada does not anything to do with having ever seen him physically and in his physical presence. As soon as I saw this video, I thought, wow, this person is really close to Prabhupada. In the ultimate sense. Okay, so now we're going to go into the PowerPoint. Iskon Branch. So has anybody been to New York City? Anyone? Yeah? Oh. <laughs> Rabuji has. Did you go to the tree at Budahar? If you ever go to New York City, you must visit the tree. This is the start of Prabhupada's outdoor preaching right here. Famous photo taken by an underground newspaper of the day, an alternative newspaper called The East Village Other on October 12, 1966. And there is Srila Prabhupada, of course. And there's a few of his first followers there. Now if you go to the tree today, right over here, in this little crook of the tree, this little where the branch comes in, there's a little sign there that says Hare Krishna tree. Did you see the sign? Many years ago you went there? You go there today, there's a little sign right in this little hollow of the tree there that says Hare Krishna tree. And then there's a fence now along the side and there's a big brass plaque. And it was put there by the last mayor of New York, Michael Bloomberg, not the current mayor, the last mayor. And it says, this is the Hare Krishna tree. This is where A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami started the Hare Krishna movement and they're very proud of that. New York is very proud of it. Because New York prides itself on being the center of everything. Right? Only New York probably could have absorbed something as different looking as the Hare Krishna movement in 1966. So, uh, and there's another shot they took at the East Village Other. And when people saw that in the papers, they said, they said, look at that, look at that. He's so high, he has to hold his head to keep from sailing away. Did you, you didn't catch that. <coughs> the preaching was stay high forever. He's so high, he has to hold his head down to keep from flying away. That's what they thought. Okay, now there's some uh, recent shot of the tree. There's some aspiring Vaishnavis hugging the tree. Circumambulate the tree. I was there June 2013, a couple of yeah, June 2013. And I was chanting Japa on the bench near the tree, uh, by the fence. And it's amazing, just in the course of a couple hours, you know. People, devotees come from all over the world. They say they just drift in, you know, one here, one there. South America, Iceland, you know, India, Africa. And they'll just come in, you know, reverentially approach the tree and just start circumambulating the tree. It's quite a sight. So if you ever go to New York City, visit the tree, visit 26 Second Avenue. It's still being used by the devotees. Devotees are paying rent on it. I think there's some plan to make it a museum, that's the latest. Then you must visit, visit the donut plant. You have donuts in Bombay? In Bombay? These pastries with holes in the middle. 
devotee has a place called the Donut Plant, and all the celebrities go to the Donut Plant to get their Hare Krishna donuts, because it's the best donuts in the three worlds. Okay, so this time, branch. So, ten years after these photos were taken, in 1966, in 1976, Srila Prabhupada was visiting New York City to help the devotees celebrate the first New York Ratha Yatra in 1976. And Prabhupada, he was reminiscing about beginning ISKCON at 26th and Avenue. And only Prabhupada could have made this analogy. He said, just like Lord Bohr, Lord Varaha, appeared from the nostril of Brahma, and quickly assumed a cosmic form to perform his Leela. Similarly, this con began at 26 Second Avenue, which to, to this day is a little hole in the wall, and quickly covered the earth. That was a Prabhupada original analogy. Okay. So, but that expansion, that incredible expansion of this time, you know, in 10, 11 years, all over the world. It didn't happen by chance. Of course, Krishna orchestrated it. But Prabhupada had a plan. We talk about strategic planning now in, in this time. Prabhupada had a plan. He had a strategic plan, which he manifested very carefully in phases. And differently he manifested those phases in different parts of the world. One size does not fit all. So right now we're going to take a look at the seven purposes of this time. We're going to see the bones of the plan. What you just heard and saw on the video, that was the mood and mission. The mood behind the plan. I'm powerless. I can't do this, Krishna. You can do it. I'm here. Make me dance. You do it through me. And that's what we saw. If you ever did see Prabhupada and Rappu, it was rather stunning because you saw in one person absolute power, the power of the Almighty, manifested in absolute humility. Through absolute humility. You don't see that in the material world. So it was automatic. If you had any kind of sense of devotional inclination, as soon as you saw that person, you went. Pull out. And something hit the back of your legs and you just bow down in the street. And you did. So now we're going to see the purposes Prabhupada was obliged legally to set down in writing when he incorporated ISKCON on July 13, 1966. He was obliged to state the purposes of this non-profit religious organization called the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. And the first one reads like a slide we saw yesterday, uh, in 1953, where Prabhupada is stating the purpose of the League of Devotees. It's the same mission. Now it's just got a new face called this time. Okay, here we go. Oops. So there's Prabhupada and another rather, what became a rather famous photograph because between 26 Second Avenue, the storefront that served as the first Iskan branch, and Prabhupada's apartment, there was a little a courtyard, a little urban patch of grass, and a patch of blue above the tyranny of skyscrapers. And Prabhupada one day was coming down from his apartment and walking across the courtyard to go to the storefront. And then somebody requested that he pose by the bird house and the bird bath. Prabhupada obliged. And then we have this now famous photograph. Very famous early day vintage 26 Second Avenue type photograph. Okay, we're going to put these... Uh, where's the mic? Where's the audience mic? We're going to put the purposes one by one on the screen. As you see the purposes of this time, I want you to be thinking, what is the overriding purpose? Time has an overriding purpose, and they're directly and indirectly pointed out in these seven purposes. Okay. Uh, 
going to do? Hmm. Okay, those seven purposes. Now, to realize his mission, his purposes, Sri the Prabhupada worked for many years in India to craft, to create, to fashion a four phase plan. We didn't realize this until His Holiness Bhakti Raghava Swami went into the database and identified in Prabhupada's pre USA letters and pre USA BTGs Prabhupada's plan. And as I mentioned yesterday in lesson four, his mission's roots, that plan was triggered. The formulation of that plan was triggered by a cataclysmic event. The assassination of Prabhupada's boyhood hero, Mahatma Gandhi, triggered the formulation of Prabhupada's plan. Fascinating. Because as soon as Gandhi was assassinated, Prabhupada started writing letters to business and especially government leaders saying, look, if you want to honor Gandhi, don't just make a statue where pigeons are going to pass stool and no one's going to really benefit from that. I can show you, Prabhupada said in his letter to Dr. Sardar Patel, the first deputy PM of India, by the Nehru, I can show you how to make a whole community based on Gandhi's inspirational book, Bhagavad Gita. And Prabhupada called the community the Gita Nagari. This is the first name Prabhupada gave his mission, even before the Lake of the Bodhis. So what Bhakti Raghava Swami did was he went into that, those pre-USA writings, letters and BTG articles, and he identified Prabhupada's four-phase plan. Prabhupada, he didn't call them phases, Prabhupada called them waves, a la Sri Rupa Goswami. And sometimes he said movements. But to make it simple for our semantics, I'm calling them phases. So let's look at these phases and how Prabhupada phased them in to ISKCON. First we'll see for each phase the evidence for the phase, and then we'll see how Prabhupada applied it. Okay. Well first, before we do that, here is Srila Prabhupada in Butler, Pennsylvania, when he first arrived. And I have this here to show you Prabhupada's mood. Look at Prabhupada there. Here, here's, the, here's, the, uh, here's the situation. As soon as Srila Prabhupada arrived in Butler, Pennsylvania, Sally Agarwal called up the paper. I think I may have said this yesterday here in the temple. She called up the newspaper, the Butler Eagle, and she said, uh, Hi, this is Sally Agarwal, and uh, I thought you'd be interested to know that for the next 30 days, I will be hosting a real, live, authentic Swami in my house. Now, in 1965, if you said the word Swami to the people in Buffalo, Pennsylvania, you may as well have said Houdini, or a genie out of a bottle, or a flying carpet, something strange, something paranormal. You know, the American small town psyche is going to put Swami in the same basket. So she was smart because she knew if the townspeople just saw Prabhupada walking around with his robes, sannyas robes, and pointy swami shoes, you know, they would have probably called the police. There's a weirdo walking around our neighborhood. Take him up. Really? So Prop Sally Agarwal made a preemptive strike. She called up the local newspaper. And they said, oh, a real life Swami? Well, can we do a story on him? Of course, that's what Sally and that's what Prabhupada wanted too. We wanted publicity, propagation. Bring him, bring him down. So Sally brought Prabhupada uh, Swamiji down to the offices of the Bhakti people. So there they stand, Prabhupada, in front of this, looks like some oriental art. And they have him pose. But you know, when Prabhupada would pose for pictures, or when he would be interviewed. Prabhupada was not your normal garden variety interviewee. He didn't accept that role of interviewee. He, he saw, every, Prabhupada saw everybody, including the interviewer, 
as needing Krishna consciousness. So he would preach, you know, to the to the journalists and the photographers. Of course. He wasn't just in America for a photo op, right? Photo, photo. So there is Srila Prabhupada. He's uh, agreeing to pose for a picture. But look what he's holding. He's holding his bottle tongue. Prabhupada is, as we say in America, a man with a plan. Look at his look at his gaze. He's looking very humble. He's looking very determined. He knows why he's in America. He hasn't come to America to go to Disney World or to Niagara Falls or the Grand Canyon. He's come to America to wake them up. As Prabhupada told the reporter in Heathrow, London. Uh, you're great. Why did you come? Uh, to teach you what you forgot. And what is that? God. But it wasn't just God, it was Krishna. Right? That's who God is, the Supreme Personality of God. Okay, let's look at the phases. And these names, I've given the names, holy names and holy books. But this aptly describes what you're going to see now as evidence in the pre USA writings. Holy names and holy books. Remember what Prabhupada is doing to articulate his plan, his spiritual plan for spiritual revolution. He's capitalizing on the assassination of Mahatma Gandhi. He's taking the opportunity of that class, of that cataclysmic event, to try to launch his spiritual revolution. So you're going to see references to Gandhi all over this plan. Because people know Gandhi, they don't know Prabhupada. And they're trying to forget Krishna. Okay, let's look at phase one. Where's the mic? Yeah. Okay, you want to read phase one for me? Here. Okay, we, I want you to read evidence for uh, pre-USA evidence for phase one of Prabhupada's plan. Read that. Leaders and politicians take lessons from my for Mahatma In respect of his daily evening prayer meeting and regular recitation of Bhagavad Gita. Reciting the Gita makes one able to get rid of the learning way of life and gradually Okay, if you're going to speak, I'm learning, you got to speak horizontally. The mic has to be like this. Okay, good. You see, um, they take lessons from the life of Mahatma Gandhi. Prabhupada's using Gandhi's name. What did Gandhi do? He was famous for his prayer meetings. He was assassinated right after his last prayer meeting, where he invoke, you know, Bhagavad Gita. It's about, it's about sacred sounds and sacred book. So, Prabhupada uh, also wants people to know the Gita, but Gita as it is. Here's what else Prabhupada said. Oh, that's another thing, it's okay. Okay, so that's the first idea. Now, how did Prabhupada apply that holy names and holy books to this kind? So, read it, or hold it like this, Prabhupada. Not, not like that, like this. Yeah. Read that. Holy names from temple kirtans to Harinava Sankirtana in the streets, arenas, plazas, parks, and beaches of the world. Right. All summer long, you've heard the recordings. Prabhupada is leading his first fledgling followers. And they're just trying to follow, and basically they're trying to get high. That's what they're trying to do. Stay high forever. That was the preaching. No more come down. And you hear them, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. They're just trying to follow Swamiji, right? So they, they chant all summer with him. And uh, I think I told during some Sambanda, after six months of the chanting, one of the chanters, Howard, who was an English professor, and Howard said, uh, Swamiji, I've been chanting Hare Krishna for six months and I still have not seen the universal form. What did Swamiji say? Ah, uh, that's all right. Keep chanting. We call this crazy questions perfect answers. <laughs> Prabhupada 
Islam knew just how to respond to every kind of mentality. Okay, so uh, first they were chanting in the storefront, just huddled in this little urban commune, right? Trying to control themselves, trying to, trying to stay high forever, basically, through sacred, you know, sonic meditation, supersonic meditation. And then, Prabhupada in October, when you saw that picture, going out to the park, his prophet said, so now we're going to take the, the mantra out to the park. And those people were shocked. Oh, Swamiji, really? They didn't want to go outside into the park. They knew they were going to be made fun of, mocked, spit on, jeered at, whistled at. But Prabhupada led them. And Prabhupada's my presence pacified all those Devadhyak elements in the park. Even the jazz, the jazz drummers. Prabhupada was just playing that little Indian tom tom. Oh my goodness. He had a little Native American tom tom. You've heard it of the recordings of what you know, this little tom tom. So the jazz musicians, after Prabhupada was in the park for a while, they would come over just to hear, hey, dig this, man. The Swami's getting some good riffs. Drummers. Once Prabhupada knew Vrindavan was playing his stomach like a drum. He was getting ready for his massage. He just had a gumption on and he was strumming his, his tummy. And it sounded like a drum. So the devotee said, Oh, she was, oh she Prabhupada, how did you learn how to do that? Ah, uh, practice. We can learn anything with practice if it's in us. Okay. So, um, so then, so that was the first sun kirtan outside in the park in Washington Square Park, Tompkins, Tompkins, uh, Tompkins Square Park. And then it would expand. Now we have Marinams in so many venues, arenas, plazas, parks, beaches of the world. That was holy names. How about holy books? Holy books. Temple Kirtana, Kirtana is the the temple classes to systematic courses from BTG distribution, uh, distribution of book distribution. There were no books in the beginning. Can you imagine in this time without books? It was just Prabhupada, it was just Swamiji. Sadhu, Shastra, Vaishnav, History, Grandfather, you name it, all rolled into one. It was just Sri Prabhupada. And sometimes in those early days, the devotees wondered, why is Swamiji always talking about the Maya bodies? Who are the Maya bodies anyway? Was it some group in India that Prabhupada had a grudge against? Confirmed. So one day, Prabhupada, he was lecturing on Bhagavad Gita. How did he do that? There was no Gita, right? Well, Prabhupada was using the Bhagavad Gita of Dr. Sarvapali Radhakrishnan, the first president, not prime minister, but president of India. And it's a Mayavad Gita. You know, I remember reading it in the 60s. In fact, we had to read it for college. <laughs> we had to read a Mayavad Gita required. So, uh, one day, one fine day, Swamiji is lecturing on Gita 934, Mangana Baba Bhakto. Engage your mind always in thinking of the offer of basis in worship. And, uh, and then he gives, you know, the Vaishnava purport. Because in the verse, the personal pronoun, mud and mud, me and mine, that's used six times. Manmana Baba Bhakto. Baba Bhakto. Madhyaji maam mas guru maam e vaishya se yuk vai man apana mad varayana six times just to say me, I, my, me, person. So Prabhupada gave a whole personalist purport to the verse. And then one of the first listeners, Keith, raised his hand and said, Swamiji. Is it necessarily Krishna we have to surrender to? He, of course, he had been reading Dr. Radha Krishna. Right? 
So we just started proposing Radha Krishna's Mayavad purport. Couldn't we also say that it's the unborn, unmanifest, ineffable, inexpressible within Krishna and within all of us? And later Keith, who became Kirtananda, said, Swamiji has let me talk. He's let me talk. And then I just talked and talked. And then I just ran out of things to say. And then when I ran out of things to say, Swamiji said, Are you finished? Are you finished? And then Swamiji became like Lord Rasinga did. They had never seen Prabhupada's face. It changed from meek and mild Swamiji to this ferocious visage like a lion-like person. Krishna's saying, me, my, I, and you're saying something else that's so clear six times, Krishna's using that personal pronoun. You're saying, this is nonsense, and Prabhupada just kept blasting, blasting. And Keith said he felt like he was getting smaller and smaller and smaller. He felt like he was shrinking into the floorboards. And then he said, and then we realized that was the day we found out who the Mayavadis were. Us! We were the Mayavadis. I have seen the enemy and he is us. Famous saying. Okay, holy books. And the first books, quote unquote, were the, the, the Prabhupada had the devotees restart BTG. Re, BTG reincarnated in America. First just mimeograph, you know what mimeograph is, just crude copies cranked off the machine, even before Xerox. And then mimeograph, and then, and that was considered high tech. In our case. And then it became a proper magazine, and then finally in 1968, toward the end of the year, it was a heavily abridged edition of Prabhupada's Gita, published by Collier Macmillan. And then there was teachings of Lord Chaitanya. From BTG distribution to book distribution, even when I joined in 1970, July, we didn't have to books. One of your pioneers here in Mumbai, His Holiness Giraj Maharaj, he was, before Prabhupada called him to India in July 70 in Boston, where I joined, he was the Sakritan leader, Giraj Brahmacharya. And he was considered a huge Sakritan person because while we were doing Harinam all day, he would distribute around the party. You know, he had a stack of BTGs in one hand, and he had a big concho on the other hand. And so when the party would stop chanting, and then one person would step out and speak, Giriraj would circle around and distribute BTGs. And sometimes he'd come back at the end of the day with 30 BTGs distributed in 30 US dollars and we thought that was huge. How do you do it, Prabhu? Well, he arrived and smiled. We didn't know what book distribution was. The books started to pile up. They were piling up in the temples. Prabhupada was translating, the books were piling up. We didn't know how to do it. We just do BTG. And then seeing, you know, small enough. And then one day in San Francisco, the devotees coming back from Harinam in their big van stopped at a petrol station, a gas station, to fill up. And then they filled up this big van full of petrol and then they discovered they didn't have any money. And they were like desperate. They didn't know what to do. They didn't know what to do, so they just had a desperation. They said to the petrol attendant, they said, uh, sir, uh, we're, we're, we're just young monks and, and we don't have any money today. Uh, I'm really sorry, but we're, we have a van full of our spiritual master's books. It was full of the Krishna books, the original Krishna books. The original Krishna book was two big silvery bordered Krishna books with Radha Krishna on the cover of volume one and Dwarka Deesha on the cover of volume two. So, sir, would you kindly accept this gift of our spiritual master's books as payment? That's all we have. 
And by Chris's arrangement, the attendant was, was receptive. He was favorable. Oh, okay, don't worry, I'll cover the gas. Hey, I'd love to read your spiritual master's books. And the devotees were ecstatic, and they thought, well, maybe people would like these books. I know they're full of Sanskrit, and they're about God, and it is America, but, you know, maybe people would like to read these books. So they started going to food stores and laundromats, and it caught on. And then San Los Angeles heard about it. And San Francisco was distributing Prabhupada's books and they wrote Prabhupada a letter. We're distributing your books and Prabhupada said, Oh, wonderful, I must come to your center. So it became known, if you want Prabhupada to come to your center, then start distributing his books. It was by Chris's arrangement. <laughs> Otherwise, Again, just as they were terrified to go out in public and sing Hare Krishna, they were also terrified to present the books. But Krishna arranged it. Okay, that's phase one, holy names, holy books. Phase two, there we have, of course, in India, you know, and not only, in Vrindavan, 1975, April 12th. Prabhupada did the inaugural RT. You have a diorama out here. And after Prabhupada waved the uh, peacock fan and he blew the conch, and then even before the Shringa prayers, Prabhupada stepped out into the front. What do you call it? In the front of a curved area, some place. Okay. Anyway, he started lecturing. Welcome to our brand new Krishna Balaram Mandir. This is your temple. Take advantage. Prabhupada gave a whole talk. And they finally had the shrink of prayers. Okay, so here's the evidence for phase two, the pre-USA evidence for phase two of Prabhupada's post-Gandhi. This from an historical point of, point of view, we could call Prabhupada's plan post-Gandhi. Of course, it was divine, it was transcendental, but Prabhupada was injecting it into a post-Gandhi context. So let's Pass the mic. Alright? Phase two. This three is called Pride. Okay, here it is. The mission of Gita Nagari must have its aim to rectify the anomalies that have entered into these centers of spiritual education and regenerate them the sense of spiritual life through the exemplary life of devotees. Yes. Okay, you don't have to read the reference, but um, this is phase two. So this is a BTG piece in the 50s. Now in that article, Prabhupada cited Gandhi's temple entry movement. Gandhi wanted everyone to be able to enter the temple, not just cast Brahmins, to show the crucial roles temple play in a spiritual revolution. Unfortunately, the temples have become, as Prabhupada wrote, this is in the 1950s, listen to this, Prabhupada said, the temples have become rendezvous of demoniac dance. This is the 1950s in India. Rendezvous, you had a rendezvous in a meeting place. Rendezvous of demoniac dance. Apparently people, you know, young men and women were just meeting outside the temples, making connections and going off I guess, I don't know, in America, it always Presley came in the 1950s, but I didn't know they had demoniac dance in India in the 50s, you know, pre-Bollywood. Hence his plan, Prabhupada's plan to regenerate the temples. Temples are for education, training, deity worship, it's the whole puncher, Triti Bidi. Although Harinam is the Yuga Dharma, Sri Jiva Goswami Prabhupada reminds us that we need to worship the deity of Kali Yuga to become clean, to become ladies and gentlemen, so we can hear her, you know, to get purified. Okay. So from day one, Srila Prabhupada intended Iskand's temples to be centers of education, training, and uplifting spiritual association. Speaking of demoniac dance, in 1974, Srila Prabhupada came to Chicago 
Now Chicago was the first place that a Swami and a Yogi and a Guru came to America in 1893 from the Ramakrishna Society, Vivekananda came. He was invited by the World Parliament of Religions. It was the first attempt at interfaith, interfaith back in 1893. So he was invited to represent Hinduism. So Vivekananda came and then infamously preached, what is all this talk of gods? I see so many gods before me in the street, loitering, Daridra Narayan, everybody's God, even the poor man, the bum in the street, excuse me, the homeless in the street, is God. So this infuriated the Western clerics. What is it? Everybody's God? What is this? So to this day, you know, this was the first and lasting impression that Vedic religion is basically everybody's God. You know, our movement is turning that tide, but that's still a lot of, that's why in America, Western pastors, priests, ministers, don't let, they, they, they don't like it when their congregation gets involved in yoga, because they think it's going to end up in, in, in personal Hinduism. They don't make a distinction between devotional and non-devotional yoga, so they still have this impersonal impression. So anyway, Prabhupada came to town in 1974, July. Finally, a pure devotees come, like 81 years later. 1974 is, yeah, 7 is 81 years after he came out. And he did set the record straight at the Ramayatra, the big civic center. He gave a nice personalist message. But the first thing that happened when Prabhupada came to Chicago, he arrived during Guru Puja time. And as you know, as you may know, Wherever Prabhupada landed, he just instantly adapted to the time of day. He didn't know what jet lag was. He was beyond jet lag. That's why the servants and secretaries could never keep up with him. Prabhupada would land, you know, say at midnight somewhere, and then, and then the, the host would serve a big feast, and then the personal party, they would all crash out. But for Prabhupada, it's time to translate the Bhagavatam, right? It's midnight. And then he'd peek in on his servants and secretaries and he'd see them all right. You are worse than dummies. Armies work hard for their sense of gratification, Prabhupada said. You are simply eating and sleeping. You You can keep up with it. So Prabhupada is Guru Puja, so Prabhupada just hops up on the Vyasasa. And there's Prabhupada, live, Guru Puja, people coming from the Canada and the Midwest and all over the place. They went down to see Sri Prabhupada. And Prabhupada's presiding over it, you know, and he's there playing the cartels, he's receiving on Krishna's behalf the puja. And then Prabhupada notices how we're dancing. Speaking of rendezvous of the Mayan dance. He notices that we're dancing rock and roll style. Because we're all recovering, you know, rock and rollers. Prabhupada doesn't like it. And we're all doing the Mughalu, the Shingling, and the African twist. And so Prabhupada looks at us. And he just raises his hand, raises his finger. This is the power Prabhupada has. And he goes, whoosh, he just drops his finger. And we go from total, you know, Wamper Stopper, Hoki, you know, Guru Puja, to pin drop silence in a nanosecond. We're all frozen. You know, we're all looking at Prabhupada, frozen in our boogie tableaus. And Prabhupada looks at us. He looks at us, you know, with disapproval. And he gestures to a painting behind us of Panchatapa, you know, with arms raised. All the Panchatapa. And Prabhupada says, Dance, dance like Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And then he lifts his finger. And we go right back into it. Such power. Such corrective power. Okay. Um, did you read that? I forget. You read that. Okay. Yes. So, temples are vital places. They're not just places for showing the deity, you know, and collecting funds. And, you know, no, it's, it's for education, training, and also so people can associate with 
exemplary Vaishnavas. They get uplifted. Okay, that's good. So the next phase of Prabhupada's plan is a good example of how Prabhupada applied his plan's phases differently in different parts of the world. Hey. Oh no, I'm sorry. Let's look at the application of temples and deities first. Got it to myself. So when Prabhupada came to America and then traveled all over the world, how did he, how did he apply phase two, temples and deities? So, you read. Temple buildings from renting storefronts to buying churches and castles to building temples. Yes. So the first ISKCON centers, well, 26 Second Avenue, what was it before it was an ISKCON temple, you know? It was a pawn shop. It was just a little curiosity shop where you could go in with your stuff and, you know, sell it cheaply to the pawnbroker and he would resell it. And there was a sign on it, matchless gifts. So they left that because it fit. You know, Prabhupada was giving out matchless gifts. It was just a little hole in the wall. It was a seedy storefront, and in a, in a seedy means run down and shabby part of town. Lower East Side of New York City. Where I joined in Boston in 1970 summer, before it was a, a Christian center, it was a funeral parlor. You know what a funeral parlor is? It's where they dress the dead bodies before they put them in the ground. Why were the first, and also 518 Frederick Street in San Francisco, the second branch, next to them were these hippies called the Diggers. They were kind of like hippie volunteers of America. They would get all the leftover food that wasn't being sold, and they would just distribute it to the hippies. And next to them were the Hell's Angels. It wasn't a real fashionable part of town. So why were the first discount centers these shabby CD storefronts? Why? It's a very simple answer. You know? Yes. Cheap rent. Right? Prabhupada said, when I got 26 Second Avenue, I, I, I risked, it was a risk. I gave the first month's rent. I think with the utilities it came to $185 or something. We didn't know where the second month's rent was coming from. So as, as devotees joined and resources became available, it became from renting storefronts to buying churches. To this day, the Los Angeles American headquarters in Los Angeles North American BBT is headquartered there too. That is a former Methodist church with these big columns. Yeah, and they made it into a nice temple for being important. And then the devotees started in Europe, they started buying up these castles in Germany and, and in France. <clears throat> and then the devotees started to build their own Vedic style temples. Or Tamal Krishnamaraj in Dallas, Texas. He took a former church and he just transformed it into a Kalachanji's palace. <laughs> nice. Okay, temples and how about deities? Deities. From deity painting to importing deities to crafting deities. So the first deities were uh, painted by the first devotees. In 26 Second Avenue it was Jadarani, Manati. And then, and, oh, in San Francisco, there was an exception because Mal, Mal, uh, Malati Manaji's husband, Sham Sundar, he could also carve. And he's a very talented person. Great writer, he could carve, he, he, he knew how to do so many things. So, uh, when Malati, you know the story of how Lord Jagannath came to San Francisco, you probably know heard the story. Malati stole Lord Jagannath out of a store. It was an import store, and there was a big bin of Indian-looking figurines, right? So she goes in, and she does what we call in our hippie days, uh, liberating the merchandise. We didn't call it stealing. Or sometimes they call it the three-finger discount. You know, put it in her handbag. I'm happy to have you be here. Liberating the merchandise from the pigs, right? 
So she takes him to look at India. So she brought him back to this girlfriend. She said, Swamiji, are you this from India? And she was amazed and immediately Prabhupada makes pronouns. Oh, Lord Jagannath is coming. Uh, were there two other figurines in the bin? Oh uh, yeah, there were some more. So she goes back and she gets Lord Balaram and Subhadra Maharaj. And then uh, Prabhupada finds out that, that her husband you know, can carve. So he asks Shyam Sutra, can you so you can carve? Deities, that please? Oh yes, I can do that. And then Shyam Sutra, if you've seen this memories video, it's video number 27 on Siddhartha Guru's memories series. Shyam Sutra just, he takes up the whole video, two hour video, just Shyam Sutra. You only have time to see one, see this one. He takes you through the full gamut of emotions, from laughing to crying to very thoughtful. So he said, here's how Swamiji instructed him of how to follow, how to at least stop smoking. I mean, he was initiated. And he's carving Lord Jagannath, and he's smoking. Because Prabhupada in the beginning, he, he said the rules, but he was more stressing the chanting, he was more stressing the do's than the don'ts. Because Prabhupada, following Rupa Goswami notes, experiencing, uh, what is it, uh, ceasing such engagements by experiencing a higher taste when it's fixed in consciousness. That's Krishna and Gita, and Rupa Goswami says the same thing about the Vishakana Siddha. Yen attainin prakarena, mana krishna nivesharya. Just get the mind fixed on Krishna. Sarve vidi nishin asyor, all those rules and regulations in the Shastra. Echayore vakinkara. They should be made servants of this highest principle of getting the mind fixed on Krishna. So both the 26th Second Avenue and 518 Frederick Street in San Fran, Prabhupada more stressed the chanting than the rules. The rules were there, but he was really trying to get them to be able to follow the rules by giving him a higher taste. So Shyam Sundar, he's carving Lord Jagannath. He's got his pack of cigarettes, you know, right there. So he said, Swamiji came in one day to check on his progress of carving Lord Jagannath. And here's how Prabhupada gave me the idea that I shouldn't be smoking. <coughs> Prabhupada, he said, well, I was carving and then I noticed that when Swamiji was walking by the cigarettes, he took his cane and went, <laughs> he just scooted them over to the side. <laughs> he didn't say a word. He just, <laughs> Prabhupada knew how to teach. By example. Okay, so from deity paintings, most of the first deities were paintings. Then, uh, and then when Prabhupada took his first American followers back to India, then he started importing deities from places like Jaipur. And then the devotees learned how to make their own deities in Los Angeles, in Vrindavan. So it went in phases like that. That's phase two. And then, as I started to say, the next phase of Prabhupada's plan is a good example of how Prabhupada applied his plan's phases differently in different parts of the world. So, phase three, initiation and congregation. Now look at the top. There's an American initiation. There's Prabhupada in Los Angeles initiating a god sister of mine. This is 1972 or three. Right away in America, Prabhupada was initiated. This was not phase three. In America, he made it in phase one. Okay? Because Prabhupada knew, he saw that we had rejected everything. I mean, can you imagine a whole generation of people rejecting their family, rejecting education, rejecting the government, rejecting career? This was Krishna's arrangement to jumpstart the Hare Krishna movement. Krishna gave Prabhupada a whole generation of people waiting for them to hear the absolute truth. So Prabhupada, right away, in the beginning, in the U.S. and in the West, he was initiating people. Let's look, and then here, congregation. There's what looks like perhaps an Indian fellow, because he knows the valley of touching the lotus feet of the sadhu. Let's look at the phase for initiation and congregate, let's look at the uh, evidence, the real I say evidence. How about just a 
what? Those people didn't stop coming back. And this went on for months, and in some cases years, certainly not true. And then, finally, because one by one the devotees were doing this, they were leaving the temples. But every time the devotees would feel betrayed and let down and, and bad, the people were leaving. Finally it began to dawn on the people in the temples that, well, you know, these people aren't going away, they keep coming back. I guess there are people. That was the first congregation in America. The people who had joined in the temple and then left to get a job that they married, you know, they don't think of it. So it's amazing how things happen differently. Um, how did... So when Prabhupada brought his first Americans back to India, he started with Harinam, and it was well received in places like Surat, and the famous Surat, that just had the anniversary of the Surat. But after some time, the Indian press, the Statesman, the Times of India, they began to get suspicious of these American Americans. Here's Bhaktivedanta Swami bringing these young Americans here. And don't forget the time, it was 70, 71, 72. It's the Cold War. You know, it's still the Soviet bloc against the West. And India is trying to remain neutral. And they're pretty close, both of you. They have a lot of kinship with Russia. Right? So the Indian press began to suspect that maybe these young Americans, I mean, they couldn't really be really Vaishnavs. These are, they're probably just still on psychedelics. And therefore, that movie was made at that time. Dum Moro Dum, Puff After Puff, Hare Krishna, Hare Ram. But there was a more insidious rumor that these young people, probably the American CIA is paying this Swami to bring them over to spy. So when Prabhupada saw the kind of press we were starting to get, that we were either psychedelic, you know, uh, adventurers, or that we were CIA. He temporarily suspended Harinam, and Prabhupada said, now we're going to do life membership. Now we're going to do life membership. Right away, in phase one in India at this time. Because it's a different culture. Prabhupada said, look, if you approach big government leaders, big business leaders, with a package that I will show you how to put together, they respect me. They know me, somewhat. So if you approach them on my behalf with this nice package, they will be very happy to participate in a nice, authentic, spiritual organization. And it worked. So in India, life membership began right away. And it was a good thing because of Mr. Sati, right? He was one of the first life members, and he was one of the heroes of the whole Juhu saga, the whole Juhu epic his own personal security force, keeping the Gundas at bay when they were threatening to come and, you know, kill the devotees. Yeah. So Prabhupada knew how to do it. Okay, phase three, initiation and time. You see how different it was in different parts of the world. This is a big hint. The way we introduce and spread Krishna consciousness in this time. One size does not fit all. Like they say in the bottom of your socks, you know, if you buy socks. One size fits all. That's not how Prabhupada spread Krishna consciousness. You can read about it in CC and Bhagavatam. It's always according to the time, the candidates, and the country. Very important. Okay. This is not application for initiation and congregation. Where's the mic? Okay, read that. Initiation and congregation. That number should be in India. Oh, yeah, now it's a congregational movement. Before it was just these little devotees in these little centers. Now it's congregation based. And now we've come to 934. Okay, we're going to take a look at the last phase. There isn't much to tell because we've hardly touched it. 
Here's the consummate, the ultimate phase of Prabhupada's strategic plan. Ernest God. Aha, uh -huh. the V word. The 800 pound gorilla in the room. <laughs> the word no one wants to talk about unless they're doing something, right? There's Prabhupada at the Mississippi farm. It's a farm in the southern United States. Um, he's a Varnashram pioneer, died of Varnashram. So phase four. Let's look at some pre-USA evidence for phase four in Prabhupada's writings. So let's, who wants to read one of them? The fourth item is to organize the much discussed caste system as a solution of natural division of the human beings all over the world. National, nationalistic division of human races is artificial, but scientific division of the caste system by quality and work, as envisaged in the Bhagavad Gita, is natural. Yes, Rafa is making the point very boldly. He's not afraid to use the, the phrase caste system. Krishna's system is according to Guna Karma, not by birth. So Prabhupada is saying now humanity is artificially divided by nation, race, ethnicity, politics. The real division of humanity is by Guna and Karma. And if we organize that properly around emotional service to the most intelligent designer of that system, Krishna, then we're going places, we're going back to God. Here's another pre-USA, this, this was to uh, Dr. Patel. Here's another evidence, pre-USA. Okay, read this for both saints. When the Gita Nagini will attempt to harmonize such sweet relation between man and God, man and the world, and the world and God, at such an auspicious time only, the United Nations effort to establish peace in the world will be successful or the dream of a cashless society of spiritual equality all over the world will be realized in practice. Yes, this is Prabhupada's Gita Nagari scheme. Varnashram is the bridge, it's what connects us to Krishna. And it connects us to the world. Now, let's look at um, uh, the ISKCON application of Prabhupada's face. Okay, you ready to read? I have only done 50% of what I want to do. The farms have to be done if they are established. Well, not sure will be established. Now notice the date. This is a Tamal Krishna diary entry. Just a couple of months before Prabhupada leaves. Just a few months. Here's a corroborating reference. Uh, a devotee asked Prabhupada, I believe it was Brahmananda Maharaj. Sri Prabhupada, do you have any regrets? This is in the last months. Do you have any regrets? And Prabhupada said, no, I have no lamentation. And then Prabhupada stopped, he said, actually I do have one lamentation. And then uh, Brahmananda said, because you have not finished translating the Srimad Bhagavatam, which was a pretty good guess, right? Because wherever Prabhupada went, he would rise at midnight to continue his magnum opus, his great work, his life's work, translating the Bhagavatam. Because you have not finished translating the Bhagavatam, Prabhupada replied, no, that I have not established Varnashram. That was from Prabhupada's personal nurse at the time, Abhimam Prabhu. Prabhupada was really worried, he was really concerned that this kind continue after he would leave. He didn't want it to just be a personality cult that would die, you know, with the demise of his Bapu. Prabhupada, he was, when he left Vrindavan that last time in September to try to do another world tour with practically no body left, he got as far as England 
You know where he was headed? He was headed for Dinanagri, Pennsylvania. To, as he said, sit down and show you how to live in Varnashram. He never got to do that. Although he, he talked about Varnashram so much in his Vani. So what Prabhupada had a chance to manifest in Bapu was only a fraction of what he wanted to accomplish in the body. The good news is that the blueprints of Prabhupada's Varnashram phase, it's all there in the body. Okay, so...